This is an oral history interview conducted for the Witness to War Serving a Nation Project in Nosset Regional High School on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. For the sake of this interview, please state your full name and community in which you now reside. My full name is Joseph Leo Hughes, Jr., and I reside in the town of Brewster, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so describe for us your uh, childhood. Or any key events in your childhood? I was uh, born in Boston, and I spent my entire childhood split between Boston in the wintertime and fall and Cape Cod and Brewster during the summertime. Uh, I live in a house that my great-grandfather built, and the, the memories of the childhood incorporate um, summers uh, in Brewster. Um, so when you were in Brewster or in Boston, were there any activities that you liked to do or play? I think I had a normal childhood, mm -hmm. likes of sports and so forth. What was your uh, favorite sport? Favorite sport? Um, in my era, keep in mind this is 80 some odd years ago, not quite um, we didn't have the organized sports that you have nowadays. My first organized sport was in high school, and, uh, playing football and running track. Prior to that, uh, sports were basically oriented around your, uh, your friends that you grew up with in your neighborhood. Uh, maybe a little bit of baseball, a little bit of basketball, a little bit of hockey, that type of thing. But nothing organized, as I say, until you get to high school. Interesting. Um, so after your uh, high school, you went into college at uh, Boston College in the ROTC program? I did. Um, let me make a interject something I probably should have mentioned. I went to uh, Boston College High School, um, which has a very good reputation. and I credit a lot of my uh, interests and academic interests to uh, the four years I spent at Boston College High School. Okay, so after you left Boston College High School, how, how describe your experience at um, Boston College. Um, normal experience, four years. Um, I majored in uh, Bachelor of Science with, uh, in Economics. Um, I... Uh, participated in the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Program at Boston College. And uh, upon completion of that program, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the uh, regular army. Okay, and did you feel like uh, the ROTC program at Boston College uh, helped you to prepare um, for your military career, and how did it help you? Uh, basically, it's... Uh, basic training for, for an officer. Uh, there's a lot to be learned. Uh, it prepared me as best it could. Uh, um, the, the leadership aspects, the interplay between personalities that uh, are involved in leadership cannot be taught in a, in a program like an ROTC or any, any other program. That has to be accomplished by face-to-face uh, -face experience in the field. But as far as the mechanics of being an officer, how to read a map, how to maintain vehicles, uh, that type of thing. Uh, it did a, did a good job. Okay. And didn't you have an uh, education after college, um, before you were commissioned in Berlin? Yes. The, um, the military will send you to numerous schools in your career. Uh, the initial, <clears throat> the initial uh, program I went through was the basic officer, uh, basic I'm our officer training program at, at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Again, the uh, program of the, the school educated you in the basic requirements of, a, of an armor officer. Uh, as I say, it involved a lot of maintenance, a lot of mechanical things, a lot of uh, uh, niceties that are needed to become and function as a, uh, a junior officer. Okay. And once you were assigned to go to Berlin, what was your reaction? 
When I, um, I, I left Fort Knox, the, the basic school, I went to uh, Fort Benning for three weeks plus uh, to learn how to jump out of airplanes. There was a requirement, and, and there still is, for a regular Army officer to have a, uh, at least a Ranger uh, airborne parachute training or aviation uh, qualification on their record. And as I say, I learned how to jump out of airplanes at Fort Benning. After that, I received orders to, uh, to Europe. I didn't know at that time where. And um, just about as I was ready to get on the plane, I got my orders to Berlin. And at that time, I frankly didn't know the history of Berlin. And it was extremely important as to my next two years. Uh, what that history was, as you'll see in a minute. Uh huh. And um, once you were uh, assigned to Berlin, like, what year was this, and what conflict were you serving in? The uh, the year I graduated from BC High in 1954. I graduated from Boston College in 1958. Uh, after basic training at Fort Knox and Fort Benning. Uh, I was ready to, I, I left the U.S. to Europe in uh, February of 1959. Uh, my time in Berlin was 1950, February 59 to March of 61. Um, the background in Berlin, as I said a minute ago, is very interesting. Uh, if you look, <clears throat> I should have a map here really to, to, to show you, but if you look at a map of Europe, uh, at the end of World War II, Germany was defeated and occupied by the Allied powers. For coming from the, from the east was Russia and their allies, and coming from the west was the United States, Great Britain, France, and, and all their allies. And they defeated uh, the Nazi regime in uh, May of 1945. Prior to that, there was a um, conference or a meeting held in Potsdam, and it was attended by Stalin for Russia. Not sure who was there for France. Uh, Churchill, of course, from the United Kingdom. <clears throat> and uh, Harry Truman, President Truman, for the United States. This was after Roosevelt had, uh, had died. Mm -hmm. uh, that conference and some pre and its predecessors in Yalta and it set up the requirements of the occupation of Berlin. Uh, the Russians coming from the east took over Poland and, their east, and eastern Germany the uh, U.S. and its allies came in from the West and took over Western Germany, but left, that left Berlin in the middle um, uh, to be uh, settled. The Russians were adamant that they wanted Berlin. Uh, the Allied powers of the U.K. and France and the U.S. were also adamant they wanted Berlin because it was the figurehead. It was the uh, uh, the token that said, yes, we won the war and defeated Germany, and we wanted to, to have control on, on that, that uh, city. The Battle of Berlin mainly took place by the Russians. They absolutely decimated the city. Uh, there were many books and volumes and data written on, on that battle and, and the following history, but it was, it was atrocious. They just com completely devastated the city and the people. But keep in mind that there was, for them it was payback. I mean, the, the Germans and the Nazis uh, did just as bad going into, into Russia and, and when, they, when they attacked Russia going to, to Moscow. So again, it was payback for the Russians. But the Allied powers, UK, America, the Americans and the French, stated strongly that they wanted a um, piece of the action, if you will. They wanted to be able to control Berlin. And the Potsdam Agreement set up uh, that agreement 
that those four powers, the Russians, the French, the British, and the Americans, would have equal rights in the city of Berlin. The Russians would have East Berlin, the Americans and French and, and uh, UK would have West Berlin. And they would have total authority and uh, ability to, to travel any place in that city. Now, the crux of the matter is the fact that Berlin was 110 miles behind the what was known or became known as the Iron Curtain border, which is basically the Oder River. Um, that 110 miles meant that the garrisons in Berlin were 110 miles away from their supply and their support, which were in, was in, in uh, West Germany. Mm -hmm. That 110 miles was a, a long way to travel. The Potsdam Agreement set up the fact that, that transportation, or the transport across that 110 miles could be done by three air lanes, by a train from Frankfurt to Berlin, or by a, an Autobahn route from Helmstadt to, uh, to Berlin. Uh, and they were the only routes that could be taken uh, through that 110 mile zone, which was part of East Germany. The, um, so anytime the Americans or the British and the French wanted to travel in, they had to use one of those three routes and they continually used them to make sure they, they were accessible. Uh, the first glitch, if you will, in this agreement came in 1949 when the Russians shut down the airlines, or shut down the, the all those routes going into the city. They, they said, no, we're not going to honor those routes, uh, you're, you're up the creek. Uh, which meant that there was no food or coal or supplies coming into Berlin and the people effectively were going to be starved out and, and frozen out in the winter time. And the U.S. and British and French, primarily the U.S., started what was known as the Berlin Airlift. And for t almost two years in 1949 they transported coal and foodstuffs into Berlin via airplanes over, again, those three routes that were agreed to in the uh, agreement. That was cleaned up, and then from then on, they, there was still harassment by the Russians. Uh, they did not want the Allied powers in Berlin, and they continued to make trouble, if you will, uh, in all forms uh, for the Allied powers. Now, there were many books, many novels, any fiction and fact about the espionage aspects and the secret war, if you will, that took place in Berlin. Uh, many of them are quite interesting. And there's a lot of truth and a lot of movies out about it. Uh, but let's say that in the time frame that I was there from 1959 to 1961, uh, it was a hotbed in the Cold War. In my duties in Berlin were, I was a platoon, tank platoon commander, commanded five M1, A, A1 tanks, um, and our tank company that I belonged to had 27 tanks, 110 miles away from our supply and support, and behind the Iron Curtain, we were faced by in excess of six Russian tank divisions. Our 27 tanks were outnumbered by a factor of 30 to 40 to 1. For every one tank we had, they had 30 or 40 tanks. For, we had two infantry battalions in Berlin. Uh, they were surrounded by in excess of 10 mechanized Russian and East German uh, divisions. Again, outnumbered by a factor of better than 40 to 1 within a 15 to 20 mile circus, circumference around Berlin. If anything happened, if the balloon went up, if the Russians attacked, we were written off. I mean, there's no way that we would survive. And this came to the point in October, I think it was October 15th of 1960, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier of Russia, was in front of the United Nations 
and he got quite irate. And he took off his shoe and he slammed it down on, on the podium in front of him. And he said, we will bury you. And he was talking about the people in Berlin and the forces in Berlin. And he said, we will bury you. Now, here we are sitting in Berlin. This head of, of, of Russia, the United USSR, I should say, well, it wasn't Russia, Russia per se, told the world that he was going to bury us. Um, interesting. At the time, I didn't realize how historic that particular time time frame was. But it, it, uh, as it turned out, um, what that evolved in was the Berlin Wall, which went up in August of 1961. And this time frame that I was in Berlin was that two-year time frame prior to that. And uh, the Russians were vehement that they wanted to get rid of us, to get us out of Berlin. Uh, it never happened until the 1980s when the USSR uh, dissolved into separate republics. Um, stop that for a second. We can't. No, it's all right. Um, I left Berlin shortly before the uh, the, the wall itself went up. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go into the reasoning behind the wall. I'll, I'll do it quickly. The, the wall went up. Um, you put up a wall, if you will, to stop somebody from crossing it. In this case, in the case of Berlin, they wanted to prevent the East Berlin people, the populace of East Berlin and East Germany, from leaving East Germany and East Berlin to go to the West, to go to, in this case, West Berlin. If they got to West Berlin, they could fly out to the, the rest of the world. Uh, East Berlin, particularly in East Germany, was a desperate place to live. Their economy was a disaster. They had no jobs. They had no uh, economic support uh, in their economy. Uh, it was a poor, poor place to live. And they could look across and see in West Berlin uh, a vibrant, uh, rich environment uh, that the, their, their cousins and their neighbors and their friends across that border were living under. And here they were starving to death almost. And, he, and West Berlin was enjoying the best uh, that the West could offer. And they wanted, the East Germans and the East Germany, East Berliners wanted to get over to the, so, and they were draining out the doctors, the educated people, the laborers are all leaving the East, going West, and the communists had to stop it. And the route they took was to put up the Berlin Wall. Um, you might take a look on YouTube on the internet and put in the term Checkpoint Charlie Tanks. And if you do that, you'll see options, uh, two or three very good articles, which were uh, put in there by about Checkpoint Charlie and the, the East Berlin Wall going up. Uh, in that, you'll see um, a number of tanks, M48A1s, those are my tanks, mm -hmm. uh, roaring up to the, to the checkpoint. The only thing is I had left a few months before then and uh, they were under the command of, of my, my, my uh, the gentleman that came after me. But it, it's a, it was a scary incident. It, 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 was, it sounded like the, uh, the showdown at uh, OK Corral, except it was done with 90 millimeter tank cannons instead of six shooters. So do you have any like vivid personal memories from this time? or? Anecdotes that you like, can clearly remember what happened. <laughs> I, have, I have a lot of them. Yeah. Anecdotes. Any notable ones? Uh, to give you a uh, a feel of the environment, um, tell you about a young second lieutenant uh, who had the duty to to was in command of a, a group of soldiers going down the. the 
Autobahn route from Helmstedt to Berlin, uh, going, going from Berlin, to get, again, as I mentioned, uh, to get to Berlin to the West, to West Germany, where the American bases were, you had to go across the air route, the, tank, the uh, train route, or the Autobahn. And we went across the Autobahn as much as possible to keep uh, our ability to do so. Uh, and in this particular time, I, I was in command of uh, a group of soldiers coming in from coming back from training from West Berlin, from West Germany to Berlin, that 110 mile area. And I had uh, three large trucks, three jeeps, and uh, some around 30 soldiers to include six MPs and the rest were tankers. Uh, and when in doing so, my requirement was, uh, my orders were, Number one, you, you must take them through the zone and you cannot stop. You cannot get out of your vehicles. You cannot take any pictures. And you have to check in uh, at the Russian checkpoints at the, the border in, in West Germany, in West Germany and, the and the checkpoint in, uh, in Berlin. In doing that, you could also ensure that the Russians could not get on your vehicles. They were not allowed to get on the U.S. US vehicle. So I'm coming from West Germany with these, this group and this convoy. I had to go into a, a uh, well, it was a shack uh, for the Russian checkpoint. I went in, and it was an empty room, unadorned, unpainted, very musty, couple of windows, no chairs, no, no anything. There was a counter at the back of the room. I, uh, to this day, I remember vividly the, uh, the, the smell of that, that room. It was musty, and, and uh, it just had that musty smell to it. The only decorations were two large photos, and one was Joseph Stalin, and the other was Lenin. And that was all. It's the only decoration. And so anyway, I go up to the counter, and I, there was a Russian side there, and I handed him the manifest. And it was something he could have checked off in five minutes, but in the harassment mode that they were in, uh, it took him about a half an hour. And finally, we went outside to, so we could check off uh, the, the number of personnel on the manifest, make sure it was, it was correct. And the problem was that these were large two and a half ton trucks, and they had, the tailgates were up, and the canvas covers were over the top, and the soldiers were sitting inside. Now this particular sergeant was only about five feet two inches tall, and uh, we went outside and he looked up and he was he wasn't tall enough to see over the tailgate in, in back, and he reached up and he grabbed the top of the tailgate and put his foot on the pintle, the, the toe pintle, and when he went to get up, now my orders don't let the Russians on the on the vehicles, so I reached up and I grabbed his shoulder. And to this day, I'm not sure whether I grabbed the shoulder or what happened, but his foot also slipped off the toe pedal. And the sergeant fell flat and his butt into a mud, a mud puddle. Uh, he was not a happy camper. Uh, he got up and he was... <laughs> if it wasn't... It wasn't funny at the time, but it certainly is now. Anyway, he got up and that was it. I get, I get on the vehicle and we ended up going going into Berlin was no problem. When I arrived in Berlin, I had uh, the, my chief of staff of the overall command was there, Colonel, and he said, Lieutenant, uh, you have to report to the so-and-so in the State Department in room such and such. And in long story short, it seems the Russians had uh, filed a complaint about my attacking their sergeant. And, uh, like it didn't start World War III, I guess. This was the time frame that, as I say, espionage was rampant in, in Berlin. Um, they, they, any time a soldier, a U.S. soldier, a French or British soldier, I could get picked up uh, some way or other. I mean, either through the uh, transit system, sometimes when they get on the wrong train, they end up in East Berlin, and they get picked up and held by the Russians, and interrogated and so forth. And it was a quite a, my, my jeep driver was happened to be 
him too many drinks one night and ended up in, in uh, getting picked up by the, the Russians and held by and interrogated for three days by them. So it was a uh, it was a touchy situation. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I, I left Berlin in 1961. I was had a peculiar career in the sense that, uh, um, as I say, Berlin was not like any normal tour in, in the Cold War. It was a, a hot spot in the Cold War, and uh, I then I left Berlin for another hot spot in, in Washington D.C. I was uh, detailed to the uh, what they what was known as the CIC, the Counterintelligence Corps, which was the uh, follow-up to the OSS, or the Office of Strategic Services, while Bill Donovan in World War II, uh, which eventually became the CIA. Anyway, uh, I was assigned a detail to a uh, military intelligence and went to school um, to become a spook, so to speak. Uh, the only school I went to that taught you how to break locks and things of that nature. Uh, I, the unit I was assigned to was very unique in the sense that it was a detail to the Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence in the Pentagon. And we covered a, uh, uh, a variety of various counterintelligence activities worldwide. Uh, we went really well worldwide. Uh, turn that off for a second. Oh, oh yeah. It turn, just stop, stop it. Oh, we have to keep it going. I'm oh, okay. sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, fr so um, from like all this accumulative military career in Berlin and in the United States, if you wouldn't mind us asking, do you have like a, a darkest memory or a sad memory that? Um, not really, I, I, I would say the, obviously the, the environment in Berlin was, uh, uh, when you realized what was happening and, and that you were behind the, you're away from support, if anything should happen, it's obviously a historic moment and uh, it's, but at the time, I'll, I'll be frank, I, I didn't realize how bad or how, what, how negative the environment was for me. Um, you, you don't realize that that, that, that could happen. You don't, you don't think about it, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, same thing in, in, when I went to Washington at the, at the Pentagon. Uh, I was in the, that unit and the other hot spot in the Cold War, if you will, was um, the missile crisis in, in uh, in Cuba. Uh, the, the unit that I was in, the military intelligence unit, was when that was going on, I was prepared to jump out of an airplane into, computer, into, into Cuba if anything should happen in that, that uh, missile crisis. Uh, didn't, were there any dark moments? Uh, just the ones that I mentioned. Okay. Uh, if if something happened in Berlin, if something happened in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, people I think many times don't realize how close we were to having some serious problems uh, in either of those places. Okay. And um, after you had dealt with these um, issues in abroad and in the United States, after your military career, uh, what did you do? Well, I finished my military career and uh, I, I was in the military intelligence for three years uh, in, in D.C. That's why I say I had a very unique career in the sense that uh, I spent two years in Berlin in that type of environment and I spent three years in Washington in that environment and I was not really a, uh, the average soldier doesn't do that. It was a, a very unique uh, five years. After I left Washington. When I was in Washington, by the way, I went to uh, 
uh, various schools, including special forces. I was detailed. I was a liaison officer from special forces to uh, the uh, assistant chief of staff intelligence office in D.C. And after I left that unit, I went to Fort Hood in Texas and was a company commander uh, for a uh, company in the 1st Battalion of the 13th Armored Division and the 1st uh, 13th Armored and the 1st Armored Division. Uh, and after that I resigned my commission. I was a captain, resigned my commission and came in to become an ordinary civilian. Yes. And where did you live after that? I lived, uh, I worked for Merrill Lynch uh, in Boston for a number of years, and uh, I ended my career in uh, Merrill Lynch in, uh, locally in Hyannis. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for your time. This was a great interview. Uh, yes, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.